Well, good morning, church family. Hope you're all doing well today. It's a beautiful day, amen. amen. So there's a story told about a police officer in a small town who stopped a driver who was speeding down Main Street. But officer, the man said, I can explain. Be quiet, snapped the officer, or I'm going to have you cool off in jail. But, but officer, the man pleaded, I, I, I can explain. I said, shut up. Now you're going to jail. So after a few hours, the officer checked up on the prisoner. He said, lucky for you, the chief is at his daughter's wedding. And so he'll be in a good mood when he gets back. Don't count on it, said the man in jail. I'm the groom. <laughs> this uh, little story sheds some light on some different aspects of justice, right? So, so what should justice have looked like for the speeding driver? Or what should justice have looked like for the arresting officer? Or what should justice, uh, what kind of justice was the police chief going to bring when he showed up there uh, for, for the driver and for that officer who threw him into jail so quickly? The definition of justice, uh, the dictionary says, is moral uprightness, equity, honor, fair play, due reward, and due punishment. So justice has many aspects to it. Justice involves that important aspect of, of the administration of justice according to law in, in courts and in other proceedings. But justice also includes the personal quality of, of all of us trying to be righteous and just in all that we do. Justice also includes that sense of equity, fairness, towards all people, regardless of their race or their nationality, their income, their relationships, or anything else. So let's ask this question, although I think we all know the answer to it. Is God concerned about justice? Is God concerned about justice? When God looks down from heaven and sees all that is happening or all that is not happening with regard to justice, does God care? When God looks at his church, his people, and sees all that is happening or all that is not happening with regard to justice, does God care? When we look into the Bible, it becomes very obvious that God is very concerned about justice. And we notice that biblical justice isn't first and foremost a matter of rules and regulations, but actually comes out of the very character of God. And is played out according to God's own character. In Isaiah 30 and, and verse 18. For the Lord is a God of justice. And blessed are those who wait for him. In Deuteronomy 32 and 4. He is the rock. His works are perfect. And all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong. Upright and just is he. We will also notice the Bible is crammed of all kinds of, of verses and stories where God expresses his concern for human justice. It's a major theme of the Bible, especially a major theme of the Old Testament. Look at how God expressed his concern for justice with these instructions given to the Israelites in Deuteronomy chapter 24. Do not oppress a hired worker. Who is poor and needy, whether one of your own Israelite brothers or one of the resident aliens in the town in your land. You are to pay him his wages each day before the sun sets because he is poor and depends on them. Otherwise, he will cry out to the Lord against you and you will be held guilty. Do not deny justice to a resident alien or a fatherless child. Do not take a widow's garment as security. When you reap the harvest of your field and you forget a sheaf in the field, do not go back and get it. It is to be left for the resident alien, the fatherless, the widow, so that the Lord your God may bless you in the work of your hands. 
When you knock down the fruit from your olive tree, do not go over the branches again. What remains will be for the resident alien, the fatherless, and the widow. And when you gather the grapes of your vineyard, do not glean what is left. What remains will be for the resident alien, and the fatherless, and the widow. Remember, you were a slave in, Egypt, in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I'm commanding you to do this. So did you notice from that reading the kinds of people, the groups of people who God was especially concerned that they received justice? Did you notice? In that list were the hired workers, employees, right? The poor, resident aliens. Those are not the outer space kind, right? No, we're talking about foreigners, immigrants. Then he mentions orphans and widows, right? These are the individuals in any society throughout time that have often been overlooked or been exploited. Now, we might add to the list or, or modify the list to include other vulnerable people that aren't mentioned there. And I was thinking of single mothers or single parents in general, latchkey kids. They're, they're not without parents, literally, and yet they have these needs, right? How about the homeless? How about the unemployed? How about the illegal immigrants? What about refugees? What about LGBTQ plus individuals? God cares about all these people. And God wants his people to care about all these people as well. Now here's a sampling of a few verses about justice. Psalm 33, 5, the Lord loves righteousness and justice. Psalm 97, 2, righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Psalm 106, 3, Blessed are they who maintain justice, who consistently do what is right. Psalm 140 and verse 12. I know the Lord secures justice for the poor and upholds the cause of the needy. Amos chapter 5 and verse 24. Let justice roll down like a river and righteousness like a never failing stream. And then this one, you've probably seen a lot over the years on sayings on the wall or something. Micah 6.8. What does the Lord your God require of you? To act justly. To love mercy. And to walk humbly with your God. Good stuff, huh? Zechariah 7 and verse 9 gives a summary statement saying, Administer true justice. Show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the alien or the poor. In your hearts, do not think evil of each other. Now, you may have noticed that all those were Old Testament verses. Maybe wondering, are there any New Testament verses? Here's a couple. Jesus said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You pay a tenth of mint and dill and cumin. And yet you've neglected the more important matters of the law. Justice, mercy, and faithfulness. These things should have been done without neglecting the others. And then that great passage from James chapter 1. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. To look after orphans and widows in their distress. And to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Now, because this sermon series that we're in is from Proverbs, we need to be sure we go to Proverbs, right? Proverbs has a lot to say about the subject of justice. Proverbs 1 and 3 begins saying that, that this book is written to do what? To, to teach us to do what is right and just and true. Proverbs 17, 23, a wicked man accepts a bribe in secret to pervert the course of justice. Proverbs 19, 28, a corrupt witness mocks at justice. And the mouth of the wicked gulps down evil. Proverbs 21, 3 says, to do what is right and just 
is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. I think that's a key verse. It reminds me of that thing stated there in 1 Samuel 15 when, when Saul had been commanded to do something and he didn't do it, but he justified it by saying he was going to make sacrifices to the Lord. You remember that? In that statement, Samuel said to obey is better than sacrifice. And I think what God's trying to say in those verses and with this sense of, of to do what is right and just, to obey is better than sacrifice, is God saying, don't come to worship with blood on your hands, thinking you can just sing and pray and take the Lord's Supper and, and your guilt will be washed away. Don't come here having treated people like dirt and think God's going to be pleased because you've come to worship. Don't come here having taken advantage of others, having assassinated people's character, having perverted the course of justice. Don't come in here having stood silently while other people were neglecting or oppressing the poor. Don't do these things and think you can get away with it because God's not impressed with your worship. It's so easy, but so wrong to think that that religion and pleasing God is all, all about what we do right here in this hour rather than what we do with the other 167 hours of the week. Now, what we do here is important, but so is what we do with all those other hours. God expects us to know what justice is. And to work for justice in the world. Proverbs 21, 15. When justice is done, it brings joy to the righteous. But terror to the evildoers. Proverbs 28, 5. Evil men do not understand justice, but those who seek the Lord understand it fully. God expects us to know what justice is all about. Proverbs 29, 4, by justice the king gives a country stability, and the one who is greedy for bribes tears it down. Proverbs 29 and 26, many seek an audience with a ruler, but it is from the Lord that a man gets justice. So what does it look like for us disciples of Jesus to live in a just way and uphold the principles of justice? What does it look like? I'd like to suggest four words to kind of frame what acting justice looks like, what it involves. And those four words are honesty, equality, generosity, and advocacy. Let's briefly consider each of those four words, starting with honesty. Honesty. We need to be truthful in our speech. We need to always speak what is true and truthful, right? Honesty in our speech includes keeping our promises, even when it hurts us, like Psalm 15, 4 says. Of course, when called upon to testify as a witness, we must never give a false witness, right? We must never corrupt justice by taking a bribe. Pro Proverbs 17, 23, a wicked man accepts a bribe in secret to pervert the course of justice. Proverbs 14, 5 says, An honest witness does not deceive, but a dishonest witness utters lies. Proverbs 14, 25, A truthful witness rescues lives, but one who utters lies is deceitful. And I, and I assume we all get that, that, that all of us know that, that being a false witness is contrary to being a believer and obeyer of God, right? How about business? When doing business, we must use accurate scales and measurements. Proverbs 11.1, 1, dishonest scales are detestable to the Lord, but an accurate weight is his delight. And similarly, Proverbs 20.10, differing weights and varying measures both are detestable to the Lord. It's like the old story of the butcher. You go to the, the butcher's market to get your meat and you're thinking you're getting two pounds but he's got his thumb on the scale hidden behind there, right? And you're only getting a pound and a half, but you're paying for two. Dishonest scales, dishonesty in business, 
God tells us not to rig anything and not to cheat, to have truth in selling and truth in merchandising and truth in advertising. Justice demands honesty in business where there's no price gouging, no stealing of any kind. And again, I think that's pretty obvious, right? Also with regard to honesty, Proverbs talks about not moving boundary stones. Proverbs 23, 10 and 11. Don't move an ancient boundary marker. Don't encroach on the fields of the fatherless, for their Redeemer is strong, and He will champion their cause against you. Moving boundary stones is an attempt to steal from others what is theirs. Steal their land, steal their crops, whatever it is. And obviously, people who are trying to be just and ethical before God would never think of doing that. A second word that suggests what acting justly involves is equality. Equality. Biblical justice requires that every person be treated according to the same standards, with the same respect, regardless of class, ethnicity, nationality, gender, or any other social category. The Bible tells us that God treats everyone equally. Deuteronomy 10, 17. For the Lord your God is the God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. Proverbs 22, 2. Rich and poor have this in common. The Lord is the maker of them all. Romans 2, 2 and verse 11. God does not show favoritism. So God commands us to be like Him, to treat all people equally, to not show favoritism or partiality to anyone. Leviticus 19 and 15 says, Do not act unjustly when deciding a case. Do not be partial to the poor or give preference to the rich. Judge your neighbor fairly. Of course, that great passage from James chapter 2 he says, my brothers and sisters, do not show favoritism as you hold out the faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. For if someone comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and a poor person dressed in filthy clothes comes in, if you look with favor on the one wearing the fine clothes and say, sit here in a good place, and yet you say to the poor person, ah, stand over there. Or sit here at the floor by my footstool. Haven't you made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Jesus, our Lord and Savior, is the great example of how to treat all people equally with equal love and equal concern and equal respect and equal value. And we see him doing it with everyone regardless of who they are. Whether they're great sinners or little sinners. They're still sinners, right? Whether they're sinners or outcasts or foreigners or the poor or the sick. And if we let God's love be poured into us, then we can be like Jesus and let that love be poured out to others and to show equal love and equal respect for all people regardless of any of our differences. That's what justice looks like. A third word that suggests what acting justly involves is generosity. And while secular individualism says your money is all yours... <laughs> And socialism says, no, no, your money is the state's. Biblical understanding says that your money belongs to God. And he has entrusted it to you. In Luke 16, 1 through 16, Jesus calls us to be wise stewards of our wealth. And a steward was a manager under the owner of the household. And so, yes, he was the leader. Yes, he was in charge, and yet it wasn't his own stuff he was in charge of. And in that way, God has done with us. He, he, he owns it all, and yet he has entrusted it to us to be wise 
and good stewards. Now, in the Mosaic Law, God laid out principles for generosity and the forgiveness of debt. There was the Sabbath year law, which required every seventh year, all the debts would be canceled. And then there was an even, even uh, more radical law, which was called the, the Jubilee year law, which every 50 years rolled around when all of the land that had been allotted God's people all had to be returned to the original families of ownership. It was God's way of doing a do-over. No matter how poorly you'd managed your parcel, maybe you'd gone into debt, maybe you'd had to sell it off, your family, once every 50 years, got a chance to start over and, and, and maybe do better in the future. And then there were the laws of gleaning. We talked about these a little earlier in the sermon, but, but landowners were not allowed to harvest all the edges of their field, maximizing their own profits for themselves. They, they had to leave some of the produce of the field for their hired workers or for the poor who could come and glean and get food for themselves through their own labor. As we read in Deuteronomy 24, 19, the gleaning shall be left for the immigrant, the fatherless, and the widow. Proverbs has a lot to say about being generous to the poor. And, and we highlighted some of these verses in our sermon on be wise about money that we preached several weeks back. But Proverbs 14, 31 says, whoever oppresses the poor shows contempt for their maker. But whoever is kind to the needy honors God. Proverbs 14, 21, it is a sin to despise one's neighbor, but blessed is the one who is kind to the needy. Proverbs 19, 17, whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will, be re and he will reward them for what they've done. Proverbs 22, 9, the generous will themselves be blessed, for they share their food with the poor. Proverbs 28, 27, those who give to the poor will lack nothing, but those who close their eyes to them receive many curses. As you and I go throughout our lives, as we encounter people in need, whether they're people in our own families or, or whether they're people here in the church family or whether they're people out there in the community, God wants us to have hearts of compassion. He wants us to be the kind of people who want to offer some assistance. Now, obviously, we have to apply wisdom and good stewardship as we express our generosity. But God doesn't want us to be judgmental. He doesn't want us to be cold. He certainly doesn't want us to be stingy. John, the beloved apostle and the apostle of love, wrote about what love and action looks like in his first letter in chapter 3. Verses 16 through 18. This is how we have come to know love. He laid down his life for us. We should also lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has this world's goods and sees a fellow believer in need, but withholds compassion from him, how does God's love reside in him? Little children, let us not love in word or speech, but in action and in truth. Amen? So far we've suggested that acting justly includes honesty and equality and generosity. Let's conclude with one more. Let's talk about advocacy. Here's two great verses out of Proverbs. Proverbs 31, 8 and 9. Speak up for those who have no voice for the justice of all who are dispossessed. Speak up, judge righteously, and defend the cause of the oppressed and needy. Proverbs 24, 11, and 12. Rescue those being taken off to death. Save those stumbling towards slaughter. And if you say, but we didn't know this, won't he who weighs hearts consider it? Won't he who protects your life know? Won't he repay a person according to his work? Those Proverbs encourage us 
to get involved, to do something for those who can't speak up for themselves, who can't defend themselves. Call, God calls us to be advocates, advocates for the poor, advocates for the powerless, advocates for the voiceless. And many of us don't understand just how powerless and voiceless some people are. We, we just don't have a sense of it because we've never been in that position. And yet how easy it is to end up in that position where you're overlooked or you're oppressed or you don't have a voice and you don't have any power. The power, the leverage, the voice that we have may come from our wealth or our education or our nationality or our race or our connections. But all these things can be used for good to help those who don't have the power and don't have a voice. God hasn't given us these blessings just for ourselves. He's given them whatever bless, given us these blessings to be used to help others. Something happened 60 years ago that's been used to illustrate the need to get involved and advocate for others. In the early hours of, of March 13, 1964, Kitty Genovese, a 28-year-old bartender, was raped and stabbed outside an apartment building where she was living in Queens, New York. Two weeks after the murder, the New York Times published an article erroneously claiming that 37 witnesses saw or heard the attack, and that none of them called the police. None of them came to her aid. And the reason they supposedly gave was, I didn't want to get involved. Now, the incident prompted inquiries into what became known as the bystander effect, or called the Genovese syndrome. And the murder became a staple in U.S. psychology textbooks for the next four decades. Researchers have since uncovered major inaccuracies in the New York Times article. Police interviews revealed that some witnesses did attempt to contact the authorities and in some way to come to her aid. But how often do we witness someone being exploited, some kind of injustice taking place, and we don't get involved. I pray that we will get involved when we see a need, whether the thing the person needs is our honesty or whether they need our equality, our generosity, our advocacy, we will be ready to show God's love through expressing that kind of justice. I want to end with the lyrics of a powerful song. Maybe you were thinking of this song as I was going through the sermon by Matthew West called Do Something. I woke up this morning, saw a world full of trouble, now thought, how do we ever get so far down? And how's it ever going to turn around? So I turned my eyes to heaven. I thought, God, why don't you do something? Well, I couldn't bear the thought of it. People living in poverty, children sold into slavery, the thought disgusted me, so I shook my fist at heaven and I said, God, why don't you do something? And he said, I did. I created you. If not us, then who? If not me, then you. Right now, it's time for us to do something. If not now, then when? Will we see an end to all this pain? Oh, it's not enough to do nothing. It's time for us to do something. I'm so tired of talking about how we're God's hands and feet, but it's easier to say than to be. Live like angels of apathy who tell ourselves, it's all right, somebody else will do something. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm sick and tired of a life with no desire. I don't want a flame, I want a fire, and I want to be one who stands up and says, I'm going to do something. If not us, then who? If not me and you, right now it's time for us to do something. Yes, it is. Come on. If not now, then when will we see an end to all this pain? Oh, oh it's not enough to do nothing. It's time for us to do 
something. We're the salt of the earth. We're the city on a hill. We're never going to change the world by standing still. No, we won't stand still. No, we won't stand still. No, we won't stand still. No, if not us, then who? If not me and you, right now, it's time for us to do something. If not now, then when will we see an end to all this pain? It's not enough to do nothing. It's time for us to do something. It's time for us to do something. It's time for us to do something. <clears throat> World of pain, right? World of pain. And some of that pain's right in here, in our own church family. But we have to see it. We have to look for it. Have a sensitivity towards it. I pray God will help us to see others. And when we see, to not just think, ah, oh, somebody else will do something. Think, what do you want me to do, God? What should I do? What can I do? We can't fix the whole world, but what can we do for that one person, right? What can we do for that one person?